Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Learn in time. All right, a pretty long video for Forces News. Usually they're like three, four minute videos. Hope you guys are all doing well. My name is Connor. If you're new, the original link to the video, top of the description, preemptive like. Let's learn. Uh, D-Day Secrets, the genius innovations that helped secure Allied victory. S Lighthouse boats. In 1944, the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day, Operation Overlord, the Allies' code name for the invasion of Normandy, begins. It was years in the planning and saw all sorts of innovations developed to enable tens of thousands of men and machines to make it across the channel. Let me get my Normandy rock. Uh, my great uncle died on uh, Omaha Beach. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me again. And uh, so I've been twice to Normandy to Normandy to visit his grave. And the second time I went, I, I picked up a rock on the beach because I wanted to take it back. So let's go. Well, look at the technology that developed, allowing the Allies not just success in Normandy, but victory in the entire war. Here's a question for you. How did London buses and sand ensure that the Allies were successful on D-Day? London buses? The answer involves this, the X-Craft Midget Submarine. 20 were built during 1943 and 44. 51 feet long, just five and a half feet diameter. January 1944, one of these X-Craft is dispatched to Normandy. Under the cover of the long winter darkness, they surface and two crew members get out. They swim to shore. When they get there, they take sand samples. Why? Well, quite simply, no. so they can take it back to England. Show how easy it'll be for landing craft. Assess whether it's firm enough to be used by tanks. Makes sense. This is what the divers would have worn to get to the beaches to collect that sand. One of the first ever dry suits. This is where the London bus park comes into it. This is a 42 horsepower Gardner diesel engine as used on contemporary London buses. Fair really? enough on a bus, but imagine it being, obviously with this gap closed, here, right in your working space, only feet away, noise, the smell of it, the heat of it, would have been horrible. It's a very special feeling, and a strange feeling, being inside this X-Craft. Special because you realize what they achieved in these during the Second World War. But also, at the same time, you realize just how small it is. People with claustrophobia don't even think about it. scores of others like it along the south coast would have been absolutely crammed i just want to say it nowhere near what my kind of prediction in my head i had when he said what do does sand and and london buses have to do for some reason i pictured in my head like filling london buses with sand and sinking them for like wave barriers i don't know why that entered my mind it doesn't make any sense and it feels stupid but that's what entered my mind when he said it. With tents, and then scores of others like it along the south coast, would have been absolutely crammed with tents. Tens of thousands of troops here biding their time for the invasion. The canopy of the forest. Sorry, that's so stupid of me. Why did I even admit to thinking that? 
Obviously, you're gonna forget it. All right. Of others like it along the south coast would have been absolutely crammed with tents, tens of thousands of troops here biding their time for the invasion. The canopy of the forest providing them with cover from any German reconnaissance planes. It was nice weather then. We were on the canvas. We knew it was coming. We knew we were destined to go because we were isolated from the rest of the world. You could only communicate with the rest of the world by phone or by letter. Phone was cut off. Letters were had to go through the officers to censor. We were given forms saying where our position was. We were going to land on a beach called Jig, which was part of Gold Gold Beach. But otherwise, it was just a nice summer's day, and we just sat around. So the troops were safe under canvas, but it was a difficult time for the people of the south coast. A 10-mile exclusion zone was put in place from the sea back, all the way from Land's End to the Wash. So if you lived somewhere like Wickham here, you couldn't leave. And if you wanted to come to the area, you simply couldn't. Whoa. Wait, why? I thought he was going to say, wait, did I miss, miss something? I thought he was going to say, like, everyone had to be evacuated 10 miles from the coast to more inland so that, like, you wouldn't be in the way for military exercise. Oh, wait, no. So you couldn't talk about it? Okay, I, did I miss something? Sorry, guys. This is the old West Mion Railway Station on the disused Mion Valley Railway between Alton and Fareham in Hampshire. Now part of it's a cycle track, and I'm on my way to Droxford, a place with a very special connection to D-Day. This has become known as Droxford's secret siding. It played a small but unique part in the story of D-Day. It was here that on the 2nd of June, two carriages were brought along and used by Prime Minister Winston Churchill to have important discussions with people like General Eisenhower. And Churchill actually spent the night before D-Day here in a railway carriage in Droxford. This is the beach at Hailing Island, and this beach, along with others at places like Littlehampton, further up the coast, Brackersham Bay, have their own part to play in the D-Day story, an important part of that. The Allies used these beaches as their final test before they went to Normandy. You can see why. Huge expanse of shingle Similar and sand. surf. Great location to test the skills and drills of getting massed numbers of men and equipment ashore. in Hampshire, now a haven for wildlife and sailors. But in June 1944, like many rivers and harbours the length of the south coast, it was crammed with landing craft and ships of all description. The whole area would have been a hive of activity with different units embarking. This, though, is Warzash, a place easily called the Rising seen. Sun Jetty. And here, on the 5th of June 1944, 3,000 commandos came down the road and got on their landing craft. There has to be a point in the this whole process of D-Day where, like, you knew the likelihood of you being seen was inevitable, and it's just about go, 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 go. And I wonder when that sort of switched on from, like, throwing away any, any efforts or most efforts at obscure, obscuring what you're doing and just being like, nope, it's now or never. Go, go, this is happening. You know what I mean? Anyone? Leading them was Brigadier Lord Lovett. They had the job of landing and quickly making their way to Pegasus Bridge, which had been captured by glider teams earlier that night. The 
plan worked, the commandos made it to Pegasus Bridge. And upon meeting the airborne defenders, Lord Lovett famously apologised for being two and a half minutes late. Or did he? Historians now disagree on the lateness of the commandos. Some say they were over an hour late. But whatever the truth, the bridge was relieved. Famous images of troops coming ashore on D-Day. But how did they get tanks and heavy armour and lots of it across to Normandy? I was thinking to myself, like, oh, it'd be nice if they had the, the channel tunnel, but it wouldn't have mattered because surely either side would have already blown that to pieces because the British would be afraid of the Germans using it and the Germans... It's, like, so obvious that it would be useless. So even if there was a channel tunnel, I, I doubt it would survive very long without being destroyed by either side. The answer is this, the landing craft tank, 800 of which were built for the Normandy landings. How do they, they you see, you know those uh, skirts? I hope they go into it, or I can watch another video about it, or just learn about it, or you guys can tell me, of, like, clearly you didn't want water to get into the engines, but, like, how could you... This isn't that important. You know, like the, the the things that they had on tanks going so that water couldn't get in crucial components. Ten tanks could be fitted on each landing craft tank, two alongside each other, all the way to the front. It would have been really tight here with all the tanks on board. And for that reason, the crews stayed with their tanks for the entire trip across the English Channel, be it a Sherman like this one or indeed a Churchill tank. Why does this look German to me, that style of tank? The landing craft. Oh! What is the purpose? Ah, oh, God. Muzzles? Why do some have this and others don't? The landing craft tank is over 170 feet long, but its sheer size doesn't change the basic parameters and idea of a landing craft. It's flat bottom so it can get into the beach, but that means it pitches and rolls and wallows. Seasickness was pretty much inevitable. I get seasick myself. Imagine getting seasick and you have to storm a beach where bullets will be flying at you. Because of the journey, the Normandy beach is awaited. The ramp would go down, the tanks would come out and face whatever the Germans could throw at them. This is the only landing craft tank left in the world. It stands as a monument to all those who made the journey to France. It also gives us the merest hint of what it would have been like. Landings were a vital first step in freeing Europe. But then what? How would you keep the momentum up and push into Germany? Well, the answer is you need to keep the supplies coming through in vast quantities. But how, when many of the harbors of France would have been destroyed? The answer was simple, but practically very difficult. Build your own harbors. And that's just what they did. Collapsible, prefabricated harbor. Not using sand-filled uh, double-decker buses like I thought. Originally. And that's just ah. what they did. Collapsible, prefabricated harbors, codenamed Mulberry. Two harbors were set up in France and landed two and a half million men, half a million vehicles, and four million tons of supplies in 10 months after D-Day. We're at Langston remnants? Harbour next to Hailing Island in Hampshire to see oh. a remnant of this amazing feat. These are known as the Phoenix Breakwaters. They came in six sizes, up to 6,000 tonnes, and were built by contractors right around the UK. They were then brought south and sunk at Pagham and at Dungeness, keeping them safe from prying eyes. Resurrection then came. They were raised, hence the name Phoenix, and taken by two tugs over to Normandy. Sadly, this example didn't ever make it out of Langston Harbour. 
guys, uh, this is going to be kind of a might be an e easy question to answer. Or it's, I, I'm I'm sure you know the reason is so that you don't have the open ocean wait. Wow, that was a big voice crack. You don't have the o open ocean waves, you know, uh, inhibiting. No. Like making stuff more difficult than it needs to be, but I I wonder just how much more difficult it is without the barriers. Clearly, they're significant. I'm not questioning their significance. I would just like to know how significant. Like how how much harder would it be to have landed all of the supplies and troops after the initial invasion without the uh, man-made harbors? Amazing getting this close. You really do see how it was a ready-made harbour, even down to the metal bollards built in. Shanklin Chine on the southern coast of the Isle of Wight. A beautiful gorge running down towards the sea and apparently the island's oldest tourist attraction. But why am I here? What's he got to do with the Normandy landings of 1944? Beautiful area. is what's known as Pluto. And there's about 60 yards of it here at the Chine. Pluto stands for Pipeline Under the Ocean. And historians say this is one of the most significant technological achievements of the entire Second World War. For communication? Here's why. This I'm amazing wires. archive footage shows the Pluto pipeline being laid at sea. There were in fact several pipelines, but all use this same technique. Steel pipe wound onto a 40 by 60 foot floating drum called the conundrum and unwound as it crossed the channel, the pipe sinking to the bottom. The pipe itself was two inches in diameter. The flexible steel covered be by successive layers wiring. of tar, galvanized steel wires and resin impregnated paper. This is the pumping station for the line from sand down on the Isle of Wight. Oh, wait. And as you can hey, see, not all that much has changed. Pluto delivered 180 million gallons of fuel to the Allies, but it was a fairly short-lived affair by... I was way too confident, like I knew it'd be wires for communication, clearly not. ...of fuel to the Allies, but it was a fairly short-lived affair, and by the end of August 1944, its job was done and the pipeline stopped sending oil. Nonetheless, it had delivered 8% of the fuel used by the Allies during that period. Stuff like this that might be you know smaller and maybe not less significant in you know the people trying to execute this plan you know the whole invasion of, of france of, of europe um but it really gives you insight into this this wasn't just a, all right mass a bunch of troops get enough uh uh ships to be able to transport them and then try and make sure it's not seen very much and then and then execute it it shows you just how much planning and and s how many really super smart people were involved with all of this and how many things that you might not think of immediately if you're not a war planner or someone maybe i should have thought of this but you know, it shows you just how much planning went into this really interesting guys awesome great video love forces news great videos there this almost felt like a history hit video so i was kind of Anyways, awesome. Love y'all. Hope you guys are all doing well. Would love if you learned something or can teach me something in the comments or anything in the comments. You guys are always awesome with that. Hopefully I'll see you guys next video. Bye guys.